Welcome to this special edition of the Atheism Class. I'm Tom Seppalainen. I'm the chair of the philosophy department. Uh, it's, a, it's a special treat, double over, for me to be here. So, Dr. Shermer told me to be very short. I'll try. Uh, double over, first reason. A couple of years ago, I was approached by faculty in class to contribute to a new minor. The minor was in religious studies. I said, yes, we're glad to. We want to contribute by developing an atheism class. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Now, the religious studies minor today is an afterthought. The atheism class isn't. Nice to be here. <laughs> Second reason of the double over is Today's guest. I've taught science and pseudoscience classes since 1993, and uh, today's guest, Dr. Michael Shermer, is one of my personal and professional heroes. So <laughs> that's not for me, Dr. Michael. <laughs> so Dr. Shermer probably needs very little introduction, uh, but. Suffice to say that he's the editor-in-chief of the Skeptic Magazine, <clears throat> sorry, cold, uh, author of multiple books, including The Believing Brain, uh, among many other accomplishments. Uh, today, we're also inaugurating something that will hopefully become a tradition, which is a clothesline. <laughs> a BSU philosophy clothesline. Oh, awesome. <laughs> oh my god. With a theme. It's a clothesline with a theme. Um, Semper skepticus. <laughs> now, no coincidence that I, I believe that each son's name is Skepticus. Is it? Semper, 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 semper. Oh, that's right. Uh, so, <laughs> nice going to see us. But, but, so we're inaugurating this clothesline and, 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 and uh, for, for guests that, that, that deserve, uh, I cannot imagine a more deserving uh, guest uh, uh, for PSU philosophy than, than Dr. Shermer. Uh, the bust here is worthy also. It's David Hume. Uh, the Enlightenment skeptic naturalist and, if you ask many of us, atheist. Uh, our department also houses the main functions of the International Hume Society uh, through uh, Dr. Angie Coventry that some of you may know. So, so uh, please, Dr. Shermer, are you in large or an extra large? Depends if these are jammies or what. <laughs> Here's a here's an extra large. See if I have to, yeah, I, can I, I have a, I have a large one here too. It's it's PSU green, so PSU green with that. Hey. Thank, you, thank you very much for being here and for everything you've done. I'll take my Legos thank with you. me. It's alien green. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we talked about how to how to proceed with class and we said some some questions so some folks email me questions we'll read those off and then we'll open them to the floor I, I will start by a couple of things it's an unbelievable honor to have Dr. Shermer today he has been a model in my intellectual life and it's not an exaggeration to say that he is a main contributor to how I to my professional life, to my personal life, to striving, to thinking about reason, to really examining questions, to open to testing. So I, from the bottom of my heart, I just can't thank you enough for all you do, and I say that with my heart open to you. All right, so we're going to start with some questions that I have uh, received from students. But first, could you tell us a little bit about um, how you got into skepticism and the path that you've taken? Right, chapter three and the believing brain. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, I, as a student like you guys, I was just interested in psychology and uh, science and, and the paranormal, uh, which was a hot topic when I was in college. Um, in the 70s, the 
uh, Israeli spoon vendor, Uri Geller, was very popular. And, uh, and there was a paranormal lab at uh, UCLA by Thelma Moss where they were running experiments on curly in photography, you know, where you take a leaf and you rip it off in half and you put it and you photograph it and the outline of the leaf is supposedly still there. And, you know, so there's an energy field and aura. And, uh, and pyramid power was all their age. You know, you, if you sleep under a pyramid, it's supposed to like sharpen razor blades and eggs don't go bad and your sex life gets better. And anyway, so uh, I tested all those things. <laughs> of course, uh, when you're in your early 20s, you don't really need pyramids. So. Uh, but then I remember seeing um, uh, The Amazing Randy on The Tonight Show uh, duplicating all of Geller's feats with magic tricks. And that introduced me to the world of skepticism in the sense that scientists are not trained to detect intentional deception on the part of their subjects. Rats don't lie to you, pigeons don't lie to you, you know, and so forth. Nature doesn't lie intentionally. And uh, science, scientists aren't trained for that. So, um, and that's really when the modern skeptical movement began, was in the 70s uh, and into the 80s, where it started to pick up momentum, was uh, there needs to be people that are expert in a particular area that scientists do not focus on, although it's related to science. So for example, um, debates between Dwayne Gish, the creationist, and professional biologists uh, were embarrassing. Uh, they did not know, they know the biology and evolutionary theory, but that, that's not what the creationists are talking about. They're doing something completely different. So if you don't know those particular arguments, uh, you will look, you'll, be, you'll do bad in the debate. So there's like a specialty of knowing something about those particular claims. And the same thing with the, the Holocaust deniers when I started looking into the hol their, their claims, the Holocaust revisionists. Um, you know, I started consulting with Holocaust historians. You know, they say that this is what happened. What's the answer to that? And most of the time, they didn't know. Uh, and they were just weird, peculiar things. Like, they, they, one of the guys gave me this list of, like, the 69 unanswered questions about the Holocaust that you know, nobody has answers to. You know, one of them was uh, the, the door on the gas chamber at the crematoria at Matthausen in Austria doesn't lock. So, of course, I asked around about this, and everybody's like, huh? What? <laughs> Why would anybody know any, anything about that? You know, this is like some little minutia thing that they pulled out of nowhere. So when I went there, I was writing a book about this that is called Denying History. So my friend Alex and I went there. Um, so we went to the, the gas chamber, and it's like, there's the door. It's like, OK, let's see if this thing locks. And so I open the door, and it has one of these big handles like this. And when you go like that, there's a little thing that comes out. And so on the door jam, there should be like a slot where it, it locks into, right? But there was none. It was just a door jam, and it just like banged up against it. So it didn't lock. And I thought, well, that's kind of peculiar. So I said, all right, Alex, I'm going to get inside this thing, and uh, and you hold it close. See if I can, I can push out. So you know, I could I could easily just sort of shut the door open. I thought, yeah, that is kind of weird because you know, if you're gassing people, they're not going to just stand there right? and push the door. So I, I asked our guide that takes you around. These are museums, but they're also sort of like. Um, uh, memorial places where you go to pay your respects. And so anyway, it was just like some 20 year old kid. And uh, she, she didn't know. It's like the door doesn't lock. What? So I said, well, maybe you could get the next person. So she got her boss and he comes over. He goes, what's this about? The door doesn't lock? I go, yeah, the door doesn't lock. Doesn't that seem sort of weird? He goes, yeah, I don't know. I never noticed that. So he gets his boss and finally I get the head of the whole the my house and museum. And he's like, What's this now? The door is locked. <laughs> yeah, doesn't that seem kind of weird? I mean, like maybe that's not the original door. He goes, No, I, I have no idea. And so, so the next thing I know, he calls me into his office like half an hour later, and, and, and I'm on the phone with the head of the Minister of Interior of all of Austria, <laughs> who's in charge of like all their museums and parks and so on. And he's like, What's this about the door not locked? <laughs> and. Uh, you know, they, they thought maybe we were, you know, skinheads or, you know, you know Nazi type uh, anti Semites. And uh, I'm with Alex, who's an Orthodox Jew, and he's got the Yamaha. Like, you know, and I, no, we're, you know, we're going to debunk those evil neo Nazis. So we made it clear. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, we go back, and uh, he's looking at it going, yeah, that is sort of weird. And so, um, and the next thing I know, we got escorted out. He said, you have to leave now. 
<laughs> and it's like, whoa, so we got kicked out of this camp. And uh, eventually it took me two years to find out that that was not the original door. The original door was taken off right after the war, and it was in Hungary at this museum where they stuck it on sort of a model of what a gas chamber looked like at Mauthaus. So that's the sort of thing that you have to really specialize in to really know exactly what their claims are, because no historian would have any reason to know that particular thing. So one of the things that I think is interesting about that is when you hear a claim about the world or someone brings something up, you examine it. And the, the, we watched the TED talk in here when you and Dawkins and Randy went to, with the, uh, the, the um, Virgin Mary. Virgin Mary. <laughs> and one of the things that I thought was so interesting about that is you don't just a priori write all things, you create tests. You want to look at claims, you want to examine claims, you want to, you want to go and look at the door for yourself. You, and I think that that move between just conceptualizing a problem and then taking some action on it is really one of the key contributions. Like when I read the skeptic and when I see some of these things, that idea of testing claims is, is uh, right. important. Right. So uh, like with firewalking, for example, is another classic thing for us. Uh, because you always see these people doing it, like Tony Robbins, the self-help guru, and he has all his followers that pay you know, like a thousand dollars a person for the weekend to learn how to think positive. Awaken the giant within. And so they culminate in this big fire walk where they all walk across hot coals. And, uh, and it's pretty impressive. And if you don't know the physics of it, I mean, so you ask scientists about it, which I did back in the 80s, and they're like, well, it must have something to do with, you know, maybe it's positive thinking, or maybe it's the, maybe there's a latent frost effect where your feet, if your feet are wet, you know, it's like, it turns out it has nothing to do with that. It's, it's the heat conductivity of the coals, dead wood that's burning, doesn't conduct heat very rapidly versus metal. So, uh, for example, if you put a cake in the oven, you turn it up to 450 degrees, and uh, you put your hand in the oven, the air is 450 degrees if you don't get burnt. And you can t actually touch the cake, and it's 450 degrees and you don't get burnt. But if you touch the cake pan, you're burnt instantly. So it's the material and its ability to conduct the heat rapidly or slowly that matters. And dead wood, uh, it conducts heat slow enough that if you if you don't dawdle <laughs> and if you walk fairly quickly across the coals, which you usually do because it's really nerve wracking, mm -hmm. if you stand there and it's you know 1,100 degrees and you can just feel the heat radiating up and you're thinking, what am I doing? This is really insane. I mean, it's fry my feet. And uh, and as long as the bed is no longer than eight to ten feet long, you can do it uh, without getting burnt. Well, so uh, recently, just like last month, Tony Robbins had a bed that was too long. I think they made it like 15 feet long. About half the people in this seminar ended up in the hospital. And, uh, yeah, so this has been tested many times. Richard Wiseman did one in England at 30 feet long. And, and to a person, they all said, oh, I can do it, no problem. And every one of them at 8 to 10 feet, boom, they're jumping off. Because <laughs> you can't do it. Because there the heat is building up enough no matter how fast you walk, that you, you, you will get burned. Uh, so that's a nice example. And, you know, why would a physicist know anything about hot coals and heat conductivity? So that's the sort of thing that, uh, that we skeptics can specialize in, explaining these sort of mysterious, odd anomalies that people exploit in some inappropriate way that we call pseudoscience, uh, because they use the jargon of science to make it sound like it's science-y, but it isn't really. Uh, and, and instead of calling it paranormal, it's just normal, and here's the explanation. So wherever possible, we try to come up with explanations. All right, so I have some, that's a good segue. I have some questions from students have sent me. Uh, what, one of those, is there a most dangerous pseudoscience? What is it? Right. Well, you'd probably say religion, but I don't even consider religion a pseudoscience, because it's not science at all. In the sewage science category, I put the probably cancer quackery, alternative medicines, because often they are, are alternative. People will do them instead of their traditional medicines, which can be dangerous. Uh, and people do do ca cancer cure. Instead of going to their doc to get the sequence of treatments, which admittedly are brutal, the radiation and chemo, surgery, it's crude. Uh, but, but it's the best we have, and if you don't follow that regimen, then the, the chances are even worse that you, you won't. So by doing the alternative medicine, then you're giving some, at least some chance you have. Yeah. And the problem, so, but the argument is like, well, I got nothing to lose and everything to gain, because what if it works? <coughs> yeah, but there's like 200 different alternative cancer cures. Which one are you going to do? And they all make the same claims. This is the one. Go on the web page, they have testimonials. 
and all that stuff. And so there's you have limited time, limited money. You got to choose one, and without a test. So there is no alternative medicine. There's just science-based medicine and everything else. So what's the answer, by the way, whenever I ask someone, well, if this is such a great idea, why don't you publish in a peer-reviewed journal? Yeah, the answer you always get is, it's too radical. They won't accept it. <laughs> science is too conservative. Well, if that was true, we'd never have any breakthroughs in science. Nothing would ever happen. So you just actually have, you have to be right. <laughs> yeah, it seems to me the more far out the idea is, the more people gravitate towards conspiracy theories, like uh, intelligent design, or it's a conspiracy among scientists. Right, well, the, the, the climate deniers Excuse make me. this argument. But that's another dangerous pseudoscience. I guess in the long run it could be. Uh, the vaccinate, the anti-vaxxers, uh, they're dangerous because they actually talk parents into not vaccinating their children. And in some communities, like in Boulder, Colorado, they've hit the, uh, what's called the, uh, this uh, sort of uh, herd immunity. Herd immunity is where you, if you don't have enough people within the community that are vaccinated, then uh, communicable diseases can start to spread. So even though you vaccinated your kid, he goes to school, and if there's enough kids that weren't vaccinated, then the disease can spread throughout it. So that, there, that's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. And um, so um, this idea of a consensus in science seems sort of unscientific, but in fact it's the way it works. Uh, because most of us don't understand the technical aspects of most sciences, like quantum physics, I don't really understand it. <laughs> But I can call my friends at Caltech and go, so what's the deal with this claim? You know, Deepak Chopra says that consciousness is in a quantum state. Deepity. Yeah, de deepity. They go, that's, that's a bunch of <laughs> That's not what the physics says. And, and like I was at a conference with Deepak uh, recently in which he had four quantum physicists from legitimate universities on stage with him talking about this quantum consciousness stuff. So he invited me to be the lone voice of skepticism that they could all jump on. And it was my turn, but I held my own and said, you know, pointed out, you know, Deepak, to, to the audience, these are the only four physicists in the entire world who agree with Deepak. He just invited them. You know, there's a, a thousand others that think this is complete nonsense. So, right, so there's a selection effect there. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Um, well, this is a, 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 an interesting one. Does skepticism lead to atheism? Well, uh, I mean, atheism is a sort of a sub-branch of skepticism. It's just a, it, 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 so we, you can be skeptical of all sorts of things. We're a big tent. Uh, you know, it's the Holocaust stuff, the creationism, or, there's hundreds of things that we discuss in Skeptic Magazine. So the, the general principle is, is to think critically and scientifically about any and all claims. And so God, the God claim is just one of you know, hundreds, thousands. So there's nothing special about it other than Americans are obsessed with the God question, right. uh, much more so than Europeans, for example, who, I was just there last week, and they're just flabbergasted that you know, Americans are so obsessed about God stuff, and that's all they talk about. And, <laughs> and, and the whole Petraeus thing broke when I was in Europe, and they're going, really? This is like the front page news of the <laughs> press? Is who this guy slept with? I mean, you know, there's like slightly more important problems. <laughs> uh, that's Americans, you know, the sort of puerile, puritanical, the definition of a Puritan is somebody who's deadly afraid that somewhere, someone out there is having fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually related to, to one of these questions. Can one be a skeptic and a religious fundamentalist? Well, there are. There are those who are skeptical about lots of things, but not their particular ones. Right. Like all those logic type compartments, you know, like a water type compartment on a ship. A logic type compartment is you just hold con conflicting views at the same time. Lots, lots of people do it. It's because our brains are modular. There's no self. The self is an illusion. The, the belief that you, you have one unity up there, that's an illusion. And, and we kind of know how that happens now. Uh, there's actually lots of different programs, neural networks running along in parallel, mostly subconscious, <laughs> doing their thing. And, uh, and you have this illusion that they're all coordinated, but they're not. So it's easy to believe this and believe that, even though they're not the same. Like my latest column in Scientific American, actually I don't think it's out yet, um, is on a study done by some British psychologists of, on conspiracy theories. And they, they find that there was a consistency amongst conspiracists that, uh, that, that the underlying thing is that, that we must challenge authority and whatever the authority says has to be wrong. And so they, they, those who tend to believe that princes die was murdered, 
are also more likely to believe that she faked her death and she's alive somewhere. <laughs> what you, that, you can't have both of those. <laughs> she's either dead or she's alive. Right? So, um, we're, but, but so lots of people, like Francis Collins that I wrote about, right. Uh, right. I mean, he's a super smart guy. He's a, a complete rationalist on practically every single point you can find, and then he just, he just makes this one little, uh, this one little pivot at the end there and says, except for this one thing, the resurrection, and so forth. But, and he even conceded the point to me between when he wrote The Language of God and when I interviewed him for my book, uh, that I was probably right about the evolutionary origins of the moral sense, but that's how God did it. You know, God used, I kind of talked him into this. It's like, isn't it possible that just like God uses gravity to form solar systems and God uses natural selection to form species, because he believes that, and he believes DNA evolved out of RNA, and RNA evolved out of these pre-RNA worlds. And uh, so I said, why not just go one step further? Just God used natural selection in a social primate species to create the moral sense, because we have to get along. He goes, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yes, OK. So one more step closer. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, you know, so if you push it far enough, um, usually they'll concede, like, well, except the resurrection, it's an article of faith, something like that. Yeah. Well, here, here's one from a from, uh, student. Have you ever been skeptical about something only later to learn you were wrong? About what? Yeah, you mean there are, are like mysteries that I just, I just can't explain? Or, or, um, I, I don't know. Who wrote it? <laughs> no one's admitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess I'd say Lady Gaga. That's <laughs> a really like, inexplicable paranormal phenomenon. You didn't like her personality. <laughs> well, she endorses Deepak Chopra. Oh. Deepak's son, Gotham, of course. <laughs> Seriously, he's a super nice guy. I made a film about his dad, Deconstructing Deepak. It's quite good. And uh, I have a little cameo in there because Deepak's really mad at me after this debate we did. And he's at this retreat where he's supposed to be you know, serenity now, serenity now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he can. He's like, I'm pissed off about Shermer. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, damn, yeah, you're at a retreat. You're supposed to, you know, like, let it go. Is that the, the Sam Harris debate, that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh, it was, oh, yeah, so at the beginning of his film, he's got Lady Gaga going, you know, oh, he's just the greatest thing. He's the most influential person in the world today. <laughs> Deepak writes a book every three months. Oh. It takes me three years to write a book. Right. He does it in three months on his Blackberry. Yeah, but he makes stuff on With his thumbs. <laughs> and he said, can you believe I can do that in three months on a Blackberry? I said, yes, I can. I've read your books. You know, if you're writing fiction, it goes a lot faster. <laughs> you don't have fact checking and things like that. All right, here's another one. Um, would you rather be an unhappy skeptic who sees reality for what it is, or a happy and delusional religious person? I'll go for the delusion. Really? <laughs> Obviously, I'm here, so I'm not going to answer the question. Uh, I think most people would prefer some delusion uh, in their lives. So, like, there's this the number one best selling book in America right now is this book by this. Uh, Harvard Medical School neurosurgeon named right. Eben Alexander, yeah. uh, and he had a uh, an attack of meningi meningitis, flamed his brain, he went into a coma years ago, and uh, in the coma he had a dream, in which he was he went to heaven, and he found out heaven's in three layers, and uh, he was riding on the wing of a butterfly that was flying, so it must have been a rough <laughs> 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 and he met this beautiful woman. Oh, it's a shocker. And, uh, and it just goes on and on like this. And it's like, and I found out that there is a God and God loves you and everything's going to be great. There's no pain. There's no suffering. Everything is just and fair. You know, you can have everything you want. See, it's, it's so interesting to me that that stuff sells. It does. It does sell. I mean, number one best-selling book, right? Yeah. So, and and by the way, it displaced the other book that by the little the little kid called Heaven Is Real about how he went to heaven during the same kind of it, was, it wasn't meningitis, it was something else. But it's just pandering to the masses, I think. But but actually, I think he's not just pandering. I think he believes it, and uh, I think he's self-deluded. 
Yeah, but, yeah, and that market for teaching people how to think about issues or we talked before about hypothesis type, there's really no, I mean, how do we make that sexy? How do we make that exciting? Well, you, you're doing it here. You've done it. <laughs> you're, you're a great teacher. You've done a great class. He's an upcoming star. <laughs> instead of white shirts. <laughs> I, think, I think that really is part of the goal, that we use the university system to create people who value reason and rationality. We create skeptics. And we try to, who is Ryan? Ryan, where are you? Right you know, like, uh, 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 Ryan is going to go to graduate school, and he's taking classes, he's TA. So we, we try to use the system to create people, how to teach others to think, and to disabuse them of specious ideologies, like faith or any of those cognitive sinkholes they develop themselves into. So, I mean, everybody here is really the next generation of leader. Now, you, you can go and I would, I would urge you to not just take this as a class and leave it behind in the science and pseudoscience, which Dr. Foss also teaches, but to take those tools and to really use them to show others how it's done and to model it as well. I think that's how we make some social changes. So. All right, so let's kind of open it up to questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, mine is uh, uh, mine's more of a, I guess, a, a skeptical question. Um, I have a lot of friends who are kind of into woo-woo-ness, and um, there's been some recent revelations with some archaeologists in Ecuador at the pyramids that they found down there showing uh, images, like carved stone images, that very, very closely resemble uh, the hieroglyphics found at the Egyptian pyramids and the Egyptian um, world and of course people are putting the two together and saying, oh, this is proof that aliens descended and blah blah blah. How would how would you approach that kind of subject? Do you believe that aliens came down and helped two different cultures build pyramids? <laughs> uh, and if not, what's what can you offer to show that um, that that's baloney? Right. I want to show that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the aliens have landed. So. Um, well, if you go to skeptic.com, we have a nice video on there by a guy uh, who did a two, it's a two hour video, it's long, but three hours, where he deconstructs that entire History Channel ancient alien series in which they go through all of those claims. And he just shows them, you know, one by one, here's what we think was actually going on. You know, the little guy that looks like he's in a spaceship with the helmet on, mm -hmm. you know, the Mayan guy, that's actually this particular god, Quetzalcoatl or whoever. And this is common iconography of the Mayans where they show the sun and the moon uh, with people in them as if those are animated agents floating around up there, which they sort of believe. So uh, in almost all cases with the ancient alien stuff um, or these archaeological, it's called alternative archaeology, all you have to do is just read just a little bit of real archaeology to, to know what the experts say that is. So what these guys are doing is they're plucking out of context one little anomaly and saying, look, it, it, this is just pattern behavior, right? Just, it, it seems to match this thing over here that I like. Uh, but what you have to do is look at it in the context of the time. Like, there's all these medieval paintings that have these, like, UFOs floating around in the sky. But if you read something about medieval art history, you realize that, oh, these things appear all over the place. They represent the, uh, the, this sort of medieval Christian iconography. I forget exactly what it is. But, so go, go to skeptic.com, and that's w well worth watching. Although the guy who did it is uh, is an evangelical Christian, so uh, when he gets to the flood at the very end, he goes, "By the way, this one's real." It's like, oh. <laughs> so we had to like post the video and then post a deconstruction of his deconstruction of the very end of the flood thing because there is no universal flood myth. Uh, cultures that have bodies of water that flood, they have flood myths, but those that don't, don't. So, um, but so that's the general answer. Uh, you just have to read a little bit of archaeology. But, but these things come up all the time. You know, the Olmec statues in South America have, uh, of, of people, have features that look African. So they go, well, maybe the Africans came, forget the aliens, the Africans came to, to South America first, you know, before the people crossed over the Bering Strait and went down through Alaska and became Native American. But that's, that's just kind of more normal debates, and that one's been debunked pretty thoroughly now. Um, and uh, so, But people will come up with little doodles that look sort of like these doodles. You know, they're just doodles. <laughs> you know, if you do enough of them, you'll find matching doodles and, and go, well, I think that's a hit. Well, but in the larger context, is it really a hit?
Probably not. All right. Uh, question. Have you ever read a book called The Truth Will Set You Free by like David Icke, I think? Yeah, so uh, David I uh, Ike, or Ike, or however you pronounce that, he's, he's one of the more extreme ancient aliens, or the a a a aliens are actually here. They're in New Mexico. <laughs> They're living. What, what about like all the modern kind of conspiracy theories with like you know the one world that pushed for this one world government and the Bilderbergs and the IMF and like that whole kind of genre of conspiracy theories. I just passed a guy on the way over here uh, on your campus handing out copies of the Internationalist. Oh yeah. He's yeah. like, yeah, Marx. <laughs> I said he was wrong. <laughs> no, you're wrong. <laughs> I said, move to Cuba. He goes, buy me a ticket. Capitalist. Yeah, there's 12 guys in London called the Illuminati running the economy, and they're doing right. a shitty job of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is interesting, you know. I, I can't. I think it was DJ Grote who tweeted this the other day. The, the director of the CIA, we now know everything about him, so we, his, his sex life, the details, but, but those aliens in Roswell, they're safe. No one's leaked that information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much um, most people can't keep their mouth shut, and most bureaucrats are incompetent. So eventually we find out. Uh, I mean, Watergate, you know, this was the most powerful political administration in the world, and they couldn't even break into a hotel room. <laughs> uh, so that, that's typically how it goes. And, and so the more, um, this, this is basically a conspiracy baloney detection kit. Uh, you know, the more people that have to be involved, the less likely it is to be true. The more coordinated they have to be to make it pull up, the less likely it is to be true. Uh, and, and, and so on. It, it just, it, that's not how history works. If you look at any incident, even the Osama bin Laden raid where they killed him, that, that got bungled from the moment they landed. Nothing went right, uh, and, and that, that's almost always what happens. You know, after the first shot is fired, all battle plans go out the window, and we're winging it. That's pretty much always what happens. And, uh, and so I write about in, in detail in my book on the uh, assassination of Franz Ferdinand that triggered the First World War. This, this was an actual conspiracy. Uh, the Black Hand, the Serbian nationalist that, uh, was, uh, that didn't like the Austrian Austro-Hungarian Empire, of which Franz Ferdinand was about to become king, so they will we'll knock him off, and this will start the revolution. So, and there was like half a dozen of them, and they had to like meet in secret, and they had to each go to a separate house and like give the password, and then they were handed the weapon, a pistol, or rifle, or a hand grenade, or whatever, and, and then they each were positioned along the parade route. Um, and uh, but but it was you know one guy chickened out another guy got sort of bumped by the crowd and he was too far away and another guy shot and missed and another guy threw the hand grenade and bounced off the car rolled into the car behind him and blew up and killed most people and and that was it they dr they drove off and nothing happened and uh, but then uh, so uh, Franz Ferdinand went to the hospital to visit the people that were hurt in the car behind him and then after that he gave a little speech to the people anyway unbelievably. And then he gets back in the car and says, well, let's just go back on the parade route. And so they, they do, and so one of the conspirators is just sitting there on the curb, despondent that the whole thing was a bust. And here he comes. It's like, oh, thank you. Bam. <laughs> and that's pretty much how things go. Right? So the idea that the Bush administration orchestrated 9-11 by having thousands of people in a perfectly well-oiled machine coordinated to fly the planes with remote control devices, but first landing the planes, taking all the people off, gassing them somewhere, and then taking them <laughs> off again, and then all those people that allegedly made phone calls to their loved ones as they were in the air, those are all fake conversations because the CIA has this equipment that can monitor, that can mimic human voices and somehow have conversations with people that they know and that people didn't know, that it was not them, it was a computer, and on and on and on. So, you know, my take on, you know, how we know that the Bush administration did not orchestrate 9-11 because... It worked. <laughs> so, uh, and that's true for most conspiracies. Um, you had a great, uh, you were on a great panel a while back. Um, speaking of 9-11, you were talking with the guys on News Change. I remember I was watching this interview. Oh, yes, the News Change, um, right. And he said something that really struck with me. It stuck with me. He said, uh, in the mind of a conspiracy theorist, there are no coincidences. Yes, that's, that's, that's right. Uh, so there is a kind of a transcendental mindset that Everything that happens, happens for a reason. And when you're in that little bubble, it, it does make sense. You, you can fit everything in it. Uh, and, but when you're outside of the bubble, then it's like, well, chance is chance. Things, weird things do happen. So this morning, uh, we're having breakfast at this diner, just down by the, that bike shop, right where I'm staying at that hotel. 
and um, my pals. So I'm just sitting there in the diner eating my eggs, and and I happen to look up, and out on the sidewalk a guy's walking this way, and it's like, this guy really looks familiar. I, I, I think I've seen this guy before, and he's looking at me like, hey, I can't believe it's you, and I'm like, and I don't want to like, you know, I'd like I don't know him. But I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah, I know you. <laughs> and uh, so he comes in. And I'm like, and he's like, Mike, I can't believe it. What are the chances? I'm like, gosh, I'm really sorry. I can't remember your name. He goes, it's Scott, your agent. <laughs> oh, that's so embarrassing. Uh, the guy that books me and lectures in, and like, oh, no. Anyway, he forgave me. He lives in Connecticut, so I've never, I actually only seen him a few times in 20 years, but still, that's pretty bad. But what are the chances? I mean, the chances are pretty slim that this would happen. He happened to be in town from Connecticut because there's some big convention here for college speakers and who, who they book or whatever. Anyway, so and he just happened to be doing a walkabout, so we got to thinking, well, what if I had left 10 minutes earlier this morning, or you had left 10 minutes later, or you, we would have missed each other, and it's like, that's all true, but, yeah. but, but, but yeah. We're, we're, we're only remembering the hits. Right. Uh, maybe because I saw you and I spent 15 more minutes here in the restaurant, I didn't run into somebody at the bike shop, which I did go to, uh, but maybe I would have seen somebody I knew at the bike shop, but now I didn't, and there's, you know, a hundred other things that might have happened that didn't but we only remember every once in a while something really weird like that happens. And our brains are just wired to notice those and forget all of the misses. That whole idea of what are the chances, that, that <laughs> doesn't make sense if you ask the question beforehand. Like 15 the term, yes. minutes before the interact, well, what are the chances that we're going to run into my agent? Well, I don't know, one in 100 million or something, I don't know. And then you run into them, and that makes that, that question, what are the chances, intelligible. But just seeing these, having something random happen to you, say, well, what are the chances of that? Well, there, exactly. when you ask right. it after the fact, there are no chances. Right. Mm -hmm. right? It, could have, it could have been a th one of a thousand people I know. Exactly. And I would have been equally shocked and right. surprised. Right. Although not as embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> now maybe he's not going to book me so much anymore. <laughs> Next, yes. Uh, Professor Schirmer, uh, it's, I, I have a kind of a... Nice about, and loud. I have, I have a kind of question about uh, atheism versus religion in a lot of things. Like you guys mentioned earlier, it seems that a lot of people who want to be critical reasoners and thinkers come to academia, whereas in the church they send out missionaries. And I think in a certain kind of way we're losing out on that battle for ground because we don't have people that can go out to low-income neighborhoods and even be like, you know, here's a soup kitchen, you want to learn some logic, you know. We're kind, of, <laughs> kind of missing, you know, a lot of people who are being absorbed by, by belief. <laughs> by belief, because I think this is a real lack. In yes, yes, yes. So you're bringing up a, uh, a very popular problem here in atheist circles. What can we do to grow our numbers? You know, religion, there's two ways to grow your numbers, have more babies and get converts. And uh, atheists being educated, there's an inverse correlation between education and fecundity, you know, people that have more education have fewer babies, uh, and, uh, and then also we don't evangelize. Uh, but th this is changing. I think there's more and more people coming out of the closet, you know, saying, uh, well, I mean, this isn't an issue for you. You live in Portland, or in LA. it's not a big deal to be an atheist or gay or whatever. I mean, it's whatever. Uh, but for other places, most places in the United States, that's not cool. Uh, you know, I know somebody that... Um, wanted to come out as an atheist, but and so what they did was they, they first said, no, they wanted to come out as gay to their parents, and they first said, I'm an atheist. And they go, oh, no, just kidding, I'm just gay. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Julia Sweeney's got that terrific little bit in her monologue, Letting Go of God. If you're not seeing Julia Sweeney's Letting Go of God monologue, it's just terrific, it's on YouTube. And uh, something about her, she was raised Catholic, so her parents read somewhere that she uh, she did, she didn't believe in God or something like that, and and, and her, you know, her mom was like, but not an atheist. I mean, it, it's okay not to believe in God. But you're not an atheist, are you? Yeah. <laughs> so the label itself carries a lot of baggage, right, right. you know. So but but all we have to do is change that is just by making it more popular, yeah. right? So it's skeptic, atheist, it's okay, and uh, it's just so all we got to do is follow the model of the civil rights movement, and it, it just it just say it's not okay to say those things anymore about. Atheist can't be as moral or whatever. You just say, stop saying that. That's not true. It's not true. I think it starts in academia too when people give faith based justifications for their claims. And we've talked about this in class this idea if somebody says, oh, it's my faith tradition, then they're, oh, well, geez, if it's their faith tradition, I guess we can't question it or press them. And I think that needs to end. 
So good, yeah, question. So <coughs> what you, uh, would you rather be a happy person with delusions or an unhappy skeptic? It seems to me, like, we didn't even cover the fact that maybe you're a happy skeptic. Like I am a happy, happy skeptic. skeptic. <laughs> how, do we, how do we change? You said that most people would prefer some delusion. How do we change that, that paradigm? You know, the skeptics are unhappy. Oh, they're godless. They must be miserable. Yes, right. Well, by way of example, just have a... Have a smile on your face and just be positive. That's one way to do it. Uh, and uh, and again, just just coming out and just by virtue of your your life, uh, you're a moral person. I mean, so one of these conversations I have with people. So if there wasn't a God, would you suddenly become you know a rapist and steal and embezzle from your boss and lie to your spouse? I mean, would you do all these things? Of course not. It's like, well, then, a, a, or if they go, well, yes, I would. <laughs> I'm glad you weren't. Uh, but, but most people won't. So you can sort of draw it out that way. Uh, but again, I guess following the civil rights movement uh, model, you know, just the more people that say it's not okay to say that anymore. So then all of a sudden it becomes um, inappropriate to say these things. Right. Then it becomes unthinkable. And then people just quit even thinking about it, like slavery. Uh, it, it just goes away. So my prediction for the gay marriage thing is that you know, about a decade to two decades, this will be like how we today look back in the 50s with the black and white drinking fountains. Yeah. It'll just be an embarrassment. Uh, you know, it's like, God, I can't believe all those states would not pass those laws. Now it's, a, a, you know, free and <coughs> everywhere, of course. And then my, the other part of my prediction that I always make is that, and then Christians will take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> that Episcopalian minister? One of our guys. <laughs> we had him. <laughs> they've, they've tried really... They've been successful at entrenching that meme of the angry atheist. Oh, you're just angry. Right. You're just angry without God. You don't have God. You're upset. Or, and I think to combat that meme, <coughs> you're right. It's not something we can combat through language. We have to combat through through our behavior. And D'Souza and others have tried to paint that that debate. You know, you're just an angry atheist. And frankly, my patience with that is over. But I think the way to combat that is to kind of dig deep and have more patience. And to just show through your behavior that you're actually not angry. Yeah. So, I'm not angry. I mean, I'm, I'm worried. I'm concerned. I'm certainly not angry. Yeah, this argument was made um, last week. Uh, I did a debate at Oxford University at the Oxford Union. And on the opposition side was Peter Hitchens, Christopher's brother, who's a hardcore believer and the opposite of Christopher on his politics, too. There's actually a Hitchens versus Hitchens debate. You can watch <laughs> online. I mean, how the hell do you know what I want? About the universe. Go ahead. Um, so I know living as a skeptic requires a bit of diligence because it's not natural for us to, you know, go through life with logic forefront in our minds. Now, when you do find, or if you find yourself, um, you know, I guess slacking a bit on that, as I think most humans do, even with the knowledge of logic and you know, correct epistemology. Um, where do you find that you um, like slack the most, and you know how often would you say? Probably politically, because I'm a libertarian. <laughs> so we're we're sort of the uh, the black sheep of the <laughs> political spectrum. I, I voted for Gary Johnson. You know, I don't think we even got one percent of the votes. <laughs> yeah, so so all my liberal friends say, you know, everybody gets one goofy belief, and that's Shermer's. <laughs> Maybe uh, I'll confess I have a bias there. Uh, but what I try to do is actually uh, read what the critics of libertarians say. And it's not hard because people send me that all the time. <laughs> uh, there's books, you know, good books on this. And so I, I admit, yeah, there's some, there's some flaws with the theory. Okay. So, but really the principle is reading what the other side says. And, and rarely do any of us do this. If you're politically conservative, you read the Wall Street Journal, you listen to Rush, and you watch Hannity, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so forth. If you're liberal, you, you read the New York Times, you watch Bill Maher, you listen to NPR. Yeah, everybody does this. We filter it out. So once in a while, you should pick up the other side's paper and see what they have, have to say. Uh, if for nothing else, it just strengthens your strengthens your faith, <laughs> uh, which is what they tell Christians to do. Yeah, go ahead and go to that atheist thing. Read Hitchens, whatever, just so you know what the enemy thinks. Uh, but, but that really is actually a good way to broaden your mind. Travel is a good proxy for openness to experience. And, and openness to experience and travel makes you more liberal. If for nothing else, by dint of exposure to other people's lives and ideas, and, and so that's a good thing. Well, when I talk to some of my friends and family about just 
why I'm an atheist, I, I get some odd responses, and one of the responses that I heard was that there are no atheists in foxholes. It, it was like the, the perception that that I'm only an atheist because I'm in some kind of a privileged position, and if I was in some dire situation, I would just automatically refer to believing in a god as some form of a psychological comfort. And my grandmother actually just a few weeks ago had said something like, well, it's it's not, basically it was something like, it's immoral to not believe in God because you don't believe in a higher power, or you don't have to call it God, it just has to be something greater than you. And I said, well, I'm not saying that I'm invincible, I'm saying there are a lot of things in this world that are greater than me, I don't understand where God comes in, like, well, you just have to believe in a higher power because you just have to. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Because you have to. Well, <laughs> how, how, do you, how would you respond to something like that? Yeah, it's hard to respond to an argument that's not an argument. Um, it's just a declaration. Well, in part, um, you just say, well, it's not true. Uh, there's lots of atheists in foxholes. There's a whole movement in the military itself of non-believers, skeptics, atheists, and so on. There's quite a few. And, of course, there's people that are believers that, um, that go to their deaths not believing. They change their mind. It does happen. So there's lots of counterexamples to that. Uh, and then if you want to pull back more broadly, you can point out how North... Northern European countries uh, are pretty a-religious, uh, and, and yet their societies are very healthy uh, and happy. The, you know, they're off the charts, the highest that scores on, uh, on happiness, self-reported happiness scales that they have. Uh, they have much lower rates of uh, crime. Like America, for example, has the highest, of the 20 industrialized Western democracies, we have the highest religi religiosity scores by far. We also have the highest STD rates, highest teen pregnancy rates, highest abortion rates, highest homicide rates, highest suicide rates. So if religion is such a great prophylactic against social ills, <coughs> how come it doesn't work here? Or Catholic, or Catholic countries like in South America, they're like 99% Catholic, and yet they're reasonably poor. You know, it's what it, you know, so the credit that people like Dinesh give, you know, Christianity invented capitalism, yay. You know, when did Jesus become a conservative anyway? He said you're supposed to be <laughs> your stuff. You know, you forget that. So you, I usually counter arguments like that with just counter examples. Then how do you explain X? Okay. Uh, you. How about way in the back there? Nice log. Thank you. <coughs> by the way. Um, going back a little bit to when you were talking about uh, how it's important to look at opposing viewpoints, um, can you give a specific example either in your professional skepticism or politically or in your personal philosophy of where upon really examining something, you've actually had your position reversed on it. My example would be, I used to be very pro-death penalty, and now I'm very against the death penalty. Do you have any... Yeah, I'm with you on that, but that's not every example. Um, because I always took the victim's uh, side, the family, the, 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 the victim's family. And uh, for nothing else, the sense of closure and justice, you know, just fry them in old Sparky. <laughs> just light them up. That's kind of how I feel about it. I still feel that way. Uh, but I've, my mind has been changed on death penalty, A, because as a libertarian, I don't like the state having even more power, especially over life and death. That always bothers me. And then plus, the Innocence Project has really shown you know, how often the state gets it wrong, either accidentally through bias <coughs> or intentionally through the planning of evidence. This kind of thing does go on. Uh, so I reversed myself on that. Um, I'm slightly less libertarian on... Uh, the amount of freedom you can give, say, Wall Street traders and, and banks and stuff, because of, since the meltdown, a combination of uh, my interest in, in uh, doping in sports, because I was a bike racer, so I followed the whole Lance thing. Uh, we knew all about that be years ago, before this all broke recently. People on the inside knew about this. Um, and it was clear uh, that if athletes can get away with it, they will cheat. Absolutely no question about it. And, and, and you only need a handful at the top to start it. And then the next guy's down, they have to do it. Even if, even if they're not quite sure the other guys are doing it, they feel like they have to do it just in case because it makes a difference. And pretty soon it trickles down to the entire peloton and then the junior riders and so on. Same thing on Wall Street. You know, everybody's so competitive, just a 0.01% you know, difference in edge. If this guy's nudging and cheating a little bit, the next guy's got to do it. And so, on. so you really need a strong state or a strong rule of law at the top to enforce that. So that's kind of non-libertarian. So I guess within the boundaries of a really strict set of rules, let people do what they want. Uh, but you still need that. So I'd say those are examples. Oh, and climate change. I used to be kind of a climate denier in the 90s, or at least I was skeptical of it until maybe the mid-2000s when, uh, when the, so much evidence was just piling up. It was like, okay, I guess 
I better flip on this one. Just, just on that, was there one piece of evidence that pushed you one? Not one piece, just lots of them, like the ice core data. Um, for example, I think maybe that's one of them. That's one of the big ones. You can really see the match between uh, carbon dioxide levels and these little air bubbles inside these ice cores that they drill. They go back hundreds of thousands of years. It's really quite impressive. So you weren't skeptical about the fact that the Earth was warming? Yes, I was. That it was anthropogenic? Oh, the whole, whole, okay. the whole thing. Yeah. You're because, true skeptic. Yeah, because the, well, the environmental <laughs> movement is was very, it's still very politicized. It's yeah. a very liberal thing. That does worry me. There should, we should leave politics out of it. Either the Earth is getting warmer or it's not. Forget whether you're liberal or conservative. Unfortunately, as you know, it's very confounded with politics. And that, that makes it confusing for a lot of people. Right. All right, so I have a question that I think applies equally well in the context of skepticism here and the moral stuff you're talking about tomorrow. So I've heard a lot about brain development and how we're reared as children and how that affects us later in life and how like abusive childhoods can have lasting brain damage. And that affects both our emotions, so we're more volatile, more likely to act out, less likely to get along with society if we weren't treated well as children, like hit, verbally abused, etc. And it also nukes the logic centers of our brain so that we're then more faithful, less able to use reason to correct ourselves, etc. So I guess I want to just make some thoughts on if we need to raise the next generation, just <clears throat> raise a next generation of children that actually are capable of being moral, logical human beings, what happens if we don't do that? And like, mm -hmm. how do we go about doing well, that? Well, we're already doing that. The shift mm -hmm. has been made over the last several centuries. As I'll talk about tomorrow night. So my talk tomorrow night is all new, all new material, 67%. New material. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, excuse me one second, so that's the Baghdad tomorrow, and door, doors open at, uh, yeah, it's talks at seven, doors open, and I think at 5.36. So, and there are student grades to that, too. Oh, hey. All right, uh, yes? Well, I should, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just ignore me. <laughs> So, uh, well, anyway, we are already doing this. Uh, I mean, the whole point of, of um, like, a public education, for example, and social programs, social justice, things like that, is to try to correct those problems of the past. So, although we still hear about child abuse, the, the rates are much lower than they used to be. There's a trend, a trend line that's positive. Uh, spanking, for example, um, used to be very common and popular now. It's very unpopular. It's, it's not completely eradicated, but um, and the same thing in classrooms. Teachers wouldn't dream of slapping their students with a ruler, so to speak. <laughs> um, so that that sh shift has already happened. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and as for abusive children, uh, children that are abused, um, there are ways we're learning more and more about how to correct those problems. Um, PC, so like research and post-traumatic stress disorder is now looking more and more like we can actually correct those damaged brains. Uh, the brain is much more pliable and plastic than we thought, so that's encouraging. Um, and uh, and we, should, we should also be careful about saying, well, if you were abused as a child, you'll be an abuser. No, that is not the case. If you are an abusing adult, chances are you were abused as a child. But if you were abused as a child, it doesn't mean you're going to become an abusing parent. Lots go the opposite direction. They become super loving, nice, so um, the causal, we have to watch on the causal arrow how we interpret that. It's, I think it's not quite as bad. Well, I think if it tends to be almost exclusively those who were abused that go on to be abusers, then we could correctly say if we got rid of the abuse, we'd get rid of subsequent abuse. Well, of course it would be better if no children were ever abused. Uh, it'll never be zero. It's just not going to happen. You know, one to three percent of the population is psychopaths. Mm -hmm. So we know they have damaged brains, they have lack of empathy, um, and it, you know it's a serious problem. That's a lot of people. We have a population of three hundred million. One percent of that's three million. Three percent is nine million, and they're not all in jail. A lot of them are uh, CEOs. 
and, <laughs> and politicians and Wall Street traders. And they're, they're very good at, at, uh, at the theory of mind, mind reading. They're very good at manipulating other people. They know what other people are thinking. What they lack is empathy. They just don't give a shit mm -hmm. about what you're feeling. Uh, and so that's a problem. But that, even that, in principle, could be correctable. Because we, we, we now have some more research on how empathy develops and what chemical processes in the brain, like oxytocin, changes that. Yes. Um, in, in line with that, I just read this last summer. A little summer. louder, please. This last summer, I read Zero Degrees of Empathy, A New Theory of Human Cruelty by Simon Baron Cohen. And he specifically discusses, uh, he's worked with autism spectrum, and he calls that uh, positive zero degrees. There's a, a negative are the psychopaths. I strongly recommend it. It does talk about uh, that these people have different pathways in their brain, and they've, they've done a lot of MRIs and such to examine where in the brain has, yep. this has gone wrong. That's a good recommendation. The book is called The Science of Evil by Simon Baron Cohen. Sasha's cousin, by the way, which is kind of funny. <laughs> 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 struck me is he had a definition for truth. He says, truth are verifiable and repeatable patterns. And I thought that was just one of the best definitions I've ever heard. I like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, being a skeptic, is there anything in your mind that can prevent the type of um, like futurist singularity like Kurzweil, or is it hard to speak of Jesus? Yes, uh, the future is always uh, hard to predict. <laughs> the future. No, prediction is always hard to make, especially about the future. Uh, so the, he's asking about the singularity of Ray Kurzweil's almost uh, religious fervor about how great things are going to be if you can make it to 2030. So his prediction of when uh, computers will achieve human level intelligence and these massive, huge, life changing te technological advances. It's 2030. Um, so other people I talk to that are in the same business think he's off by at least a century or two. I mean, it, it's our joke at Skeptic is you know we're five years away and always will be. It's just <laughs> it's always always a much harder problem. You know, when I was in college and they had the chess playing computer programs, it's like oh, we're this close to you know. No, it's we're a long ways from real computation. Even Watson, the computer IBM computer that won Jeopardy. I don't know if you saw that, but that was, that was a really cool weekend oh, yeah. of a Jeopardy tournament. Uh, but as I'm fond of saying, do you think Watson knows that he won Jeopardy? <laughs> <laughs> or do you think, yes, oh, I beat Ken Jen. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you could program Watson to like let out a little cheer if he has more points at the end. But that's just a program for like giving data the emotion chip. Aww. And then he tells the, wrong, the jokes at the wrong time or when he doesn't quite get it. And, and we don't really know how we do that. So if we, if we can't back engineer ourselves, if we can't put it into a computer. So again, it's a long ways away. And I'm also always skeptical of the prophet who writes himself into the prophecy, <laughs> and that the big thing is going to happen in my lifetime. They always say that. No one ever says the world's going to end in, well, I don't know, 2467. Whatever, that's too far off, dude. I can't even think about it. It's going to happen within the next five years. Oh, okay, I better buy my supplies. <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, that, that's always a, a, a a, a, a sign of, of your skeptical alarm should go off. They, they certainly do take that singularity very seriously. And, and the dates, when they're painted, the dates. The other, I mean, depending on what version, and a lot of people have taken the computer ethics class in here, depending on what version of the singularity story you buy or that narrative, this idea that the assumption is that with just enough raw computing power, we can generate some something that passes. Well, a Turing test would be not really. Um, the type of thing, but something that's sentient, something conscious. It always struck me that it could be that consciousness is just a property of biological organisms and can't be created through. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how anybody could know that it's not. Yeah. Right. Um, well, there's the Turing test, right? If you pass the Turing test, uh, it, it, you can't tell if you're talking to a computer or a human in, in another room. That, that's considered one test of that and computers haven't done that yet. I don't think that's the ultimate test. But, no. uh, yeah. 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 
Um, I saw you speak at the Reason Rally in DC this year, and I really liked uh, you know, what you had to say. Um, but I was kind of curious how you felt about atheism as a social movement, and and some of the like the, the criticisms within the atheist you know world about like atheism it. plus stuff. Is that retarded? Like stuff like that, and and Sam Harris like warned against you know atheism being a social movement. Do you think that there are some well? Some issues I mean, atheism isn't really a thing. It's right. not like uh, it's not like being like a secular humanist, you know, there's like a series of tenets. This is what we believe, you know, equal treatment under the law, women's reproductive rights. You know, there's a whole bunch of these things uh, that sort of go with it. There's nothing like that for atheism. We just don't believe in God. I'm also an A Bigfootist and an A Loch Ness Monsterist. And, yeah, you know, there's all sorts of things I don't believe, but that I, I, don't, I don't personally like to define myself by what I don't believe. There, there's, so the atheist movement is important. It's great. Uh, you know, it's like the gay rights and so on. Let's, let's come out of the closet. Uh, but but we need to build, you know, a positive movement. You know, based. So I guess the secular humanist is probably the the closest thing to a, a group that has a set of tenets. This is what we believe. You know, positively. These are our positive assertions about the world. And, and of course, like any social movement, they all go through these stages of you know, who's the most atheist of them all. <laughs> Uh, the feminist movement went through this in the 70s and 80s, you know, and now there's like third, fourth generation feminists, and they, you know, well, who's the real feminist? But it, all movements do this, and they usually fracture and splinter, and then they come back together. It's very common, and there's like an Atheist of the Year award that they give out, which I find rather amusing. It's like, this guy did not believe in God more than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> he worked out so hard this year. Not once, not once did I believe in God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm curious if you believe if evil exists, and if so, does it exist on its own, or is it a learned thing? Right, so evil, um, it's a good adjective for describing really, really bad behavior, but I don't think it exists as a, um, like an entity or an essence. I think that's a theological concept that uh, is a, a result of our brains that are uh, dualistic in nature. We, we naturally think there's two substances, the corporeal and incorporeal body and soul, brain and mind. And uh, so evil is often thought of as this uh, sort of uh, incorporeal essence that travels along with something. So for example, for instance, nice research uh, on uh, uh, presents subjects with uh, this box, and he opens the box up and he pulls out this sweater. And he says, uh, I got this sweater from on eBay. It was Jeffrey Dahmer's sweater. It's the sweater he wore when he mur raped and murdered and ate the, his victims. Would you like to wear it? You want to try it on? <laughs> I washed it, so there's no you know, stuff in there. <laughs> you know, people are, oh, no, no, nobody wants to wear a uh, Jeffrey Dahmer sweater. Uh, and, and you ask them why, they, they say, well, because it has, you know, like the essence of evil in it. Uh, or, you know, Hitler's jacket. No, 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 yeah. uh, he actually put Brad Pitt's shirt up for sale on eBay. Washed and unwashed. Which one think got the higher bid? Oh. Oh. Of course, you want the essence of Bradness. So, so, <laughs> so hot, right? So we have that, that you know, phrase, just have this uh, essentialism, it's called. And, and, and like, people that get... Uh, Organs donated, you know, they get a kidney or whatever, a heart. They typically almost always think they're getting something coming with the person. Some characteristic of their personality came with the organ. The essence of the person is in the organ itself. So this is a mistaken reasoning, but it's just what our brains do. Um, and uh, and so no, I don't think anything like that exists. There's just there's people that do bad things. If if you're living by yourself on an island and there's nobody around, you can't do evil. There's no e evil happens in interaction with other people. Is the same true of good? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so words like good and evil, we're, uh, really, we're, we're just talking about how we interact with other people as a social primate species. We have to get along. You got to be, for the most part, for the most of the time, pretty cooperative and nice and pro-social, or else you won't be a member of the group for very long. <laughs> so, like uh, Chris, Christopher Baum's research on hunter gatherers on this very subject. Uh, he's got a new book out called The Origins of Morality that I recommend. He talks about what they do with, uh, well, the psychopaths of hunter-gatherers. Uh, these are bullies. You know, they're, they're not nice people. 
And uh, and the way they handle it is it's pr it's pretty brutal. I mean, they'll they'll take him out on a little hunt and they just come back without him. And it's like no one asks what happened to him. Uh, you know, they just off him. They just get rid of him. That's how they deal with it. Uh, capital punishment for bullies, or they get him in his sleep. Um, yeah, just bam. Yeah. Very high line man. <laughs> yeah, well, so um, that's a pro so it's really only a problem of how disruptive it is to a social community. Uh, so that's what good and evil is. Yeah. How about you? Um, I'd like to preface with saying that I took my 12 year old out of school today. So hey, um, welcome. See you soon. Um, we are. <laughs> <laughs> all work together to parent our kids and he goes back and forth between a very faithful house and a very skeptical house and um, as a result he hears a lot of what I talk about having now been in four classes with Bogosian. Um, I would like to ask you if if Charlie were to be an ambassador going back to school talking to his middle school buddies about this crazy lecture he just saw today if you could tell the middle school set anything, send a message about critical thinking, what would you say? Think for yourself. <laughs> and how, how is that? Because you know that they're going to hear that and be like, yeah, yeah, I already do, I am, and I'm ignoring yes. this, right? Yes. Well, so always question authority, even the authority of skeptics and scientists. That's the whole process of the scientific method is you don't accept anybody's authority. You know, we care about what's actually true, not what we want to be true. And uh, so all it's true that you know, skeptics have biases and so on, as do religious people, because we're all human. The difference between science and skepticism and all other belief systems is that we have built into it self-correcting machinery that says, it doesn't matter if you're biased, because we can all check your claim. We can check the evidence. Your eyes, your eyes, your eyes. We, so it's not just up to me. It's not up to any one person. Yeah, so that, that would be, think for yourself. I'll add two things to that. Charlie, right? Is Charlie? Let me put that spot. I'd add two things. Ask yourself how the belief could be wrong. How could you be wrong? And then really genuinely think, okay, so what conditions would have to be in place for that belief to be wrong? And then ask yourself, what would it take for me to change my mind? What would it take? What piece of evidence would it take for me to change my mind? How, how is, for me to revise my belief, what would that mean? What would that take? And I think even doing that, and we've talked about that in here, will create spaces of belief openness. So I think that's important too. Cool. Yeah, I mean, like with religion, when you're dealing with religion, it's, it, it, one nice question to ask is, what are the chances that this person got it right and all these billions of other people are wrong? Maybe they're all the products of their culture and their time and so on. This is what I, the argument I made at the, Oxford Union, it's like, so the other side, they're all three evangelicals, okay? So there, there's, a, there's a billion, two billion Christians in the world, a billion Catholics and a billion others. And then, then there's a billion Muslims who believe rather differently. They do not accept Jesus as their savior. And there's lots of people that don't accept Jesus as their, are they all going to hell? I mean, do you really think you got it right and everybody else is wrong? Well, when you're in the bubble, that is exactly what you think. Because <laughs> when I was a Christian, I was at Pepperdine University, and that little born-again bubble, that's what you think. And people go, what are the chances you got it right? I think, pretty good. <laughs> I am right. <laughs> you know, but then, uh, but, so exposure to other people's beliefs makes you realize, you know what, that guy's a nice guy, and he believes just as strongly as me, and he believes differently. Maybe I'm not right. You know, so that's always it. I could be wrong is like one of the best things you can say. Uh, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, what do you think about the recent popularity of fMRIs, especially in terms of like mapping out the morality of individuals and the motivation behind their decisions? As a skeptic, how much do you think we really know about the brain and how much can we rely upon that to tell us? Yeah, good question on functional MRIs. I, I love the research. It's great that we're breaking into the black box that Skinner said we weren't supposed to do because I was doing his behavior. So <laughs> I think it's good. Um, but there are cautions, of course. Uh, you know, it's, not, it's, it's kind of a new phrenology, as some people say. Um, that uh, and, and and we have to remember that when you see those pictures in the popular magazines of a brain, you know, with the little colored dots, it does, it doesn't look like that at all. There, that's no, there's no such thing as that. That's a statistical artifact that's added later, so you can see what's going on. 
And all it's measuring is blood flow change from one part of the brain to the other. So you have to design these experiments in a way to have the person do think about this and then think about that. You've got to give them a choice of some kind with the idea that the blood will rush to one area to the other area because neurons firing consume oxygen, so they send out chemical signals. It draws blood to them to feed more oxygen, and all that takes several seconds. So you have to design it in a way that you're, you're looking at something and reading something and thinking about something inside that chamber with these goggles on this helmet, and you, you push the button, and then it gives you another choice, and you push a different button, so your blood is moving around, and then you can see what that is. Now, of course, you see like a brain in Newsweek or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is your brain on God or your brain on money. Well, there is, that's not anybody's brain. These subjects, these experiments usually have like a dozen to two dozen subjects. So they're statistically averaged for all dozen subjects under that condition. Uh, because people's brains are different size and maybe they jiggle around inside there a little bit and they put the helmet on and wedges in there. And, and also, it's not a random sampling. Uh, one out of five people cannot stay inside the MRI machine. I was one of them. I couldn't do it. I had no idea I had claustrophobia because uh, I never had it before. And so I went over to UCLA to, uh, to participate in an fMRI experiment on uh, behavioral economics because I was writing about this for Scientific American. And so they stuff you in there. They got the goggles and the helmet and the wedges and the this and that. And you're all you know, stuck in there like that. And the tube is like right up against your shoulders. And the guy hands me this little button. He goes, I said, what's that? He goes, that's the panic button. I go, I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> well, five minutes into this thing, I'm hitting that button. Get me out of here. You know, I was just, I broke out into a sweat. My heart rate was just pounding. I had to leave the building and go outside to get my heart rate down. Yeah, and so, you know, and I said, God, how unusual is that? He goes, one out of five people can't get through the experiment. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, okay, so there's a bias there. You know, so always take those experiments with a, you know, a little bit of skepticism. Yeah, that's really funny. When I went in the EFMR, I had truly, I had the exact opposite. I loved it in there. <laughs> <laughs> I had no phone. I had nothing no phone. Was bothering me. The dog wasn't freaking out. I just went in there, and I was just, I found it to be so, so restful. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, let's, we had a hand, yes? Yeah, uh, so a lot of people, uh, it just seems like uh, most people... Nice and loud, super loud. It seems like most people have delusions, kind of have them, uh, at least in part, because they enjoy them. Like, uh, you know, the, the person who believes in Bigfoot almost has it like a hobby that keeps them entertained. So, like, um, <laughs> yes. just socially, not academically, but like socially, when you encounter someone with like a delusion, um, like how often do you just like decide uh, or... What, what situation would you decide to leave it alone? Um, well, I, I guess, from, like as the editor of the magazine, Skeptic Magazine, we decide, what are we going to do? Well, uh, it depends on how, how interesting it is in the popular culture at the moment. Do people really care about this? So we've done a lot on climate denial, for example. It's a hot topic. You know, Bigfoot comes and goes, depends on what's going on. Uh, so we kind of decide that way. Of course, nobody thinks they're delusional. I mean, there's, from a, nobody thinks they're a pseudoscientist. <coughs> nobody gets up in the morning and goes, well, I'm going to my pseudo lab and I'm going to run some pseudo experiments and collect some pseudo facts to support my pseudoscience. Nobody thinks that. You know, everybody thinks they're doing some big important thing. Just like no one thinks they join a cult. Everybody thinks, you know, I belong to this really important social group. We're going to change the world and all this stuff. You, you just don't know when you're in the bubble that, that you're there. So, um, uh, which ones we pick, it just depends on how important it is socially, politically, culturally. Creationism, that's a big important one because they, they are out there trying to affect policy, politics, curriculum, education. So I care about that. The Flatter Society, I think there's two members left. You know, I, mean, so I don't <laughs> care about them. <laughs> uh, Can I just pick back? So yeah. when, when you said, so do you mean for the magazine or if he's at a party? Well, like, if you're like just sitting down and having dinner with your neighbor and they have some. Monster, there's all this evidence. I saw it on the History Channel. Yes. How often do you just like try to talk them out of that, or how often do you just like? Pretty like, much every time. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that that is my recipe or my prescription or my strong advice for you as well. When you can identify an instance of unreason, as Dr. Foster love that expression. Listen, find out why people believe what they believe, and then try to help them out of that delusion. <laughs> and do that with God be? Well, I, well, and then be open to the fact that you could be wrong. And that's again why I like this idea of testing and evidence and pressing those beliefs, using the world to adjudicate those beliefs. <laughs> yeah? Uh, from a sociobiological standpoint, why do you think people have a tendency to love to create 
rituals <coughs> around fantastic beliefs? Well, so like in hunter-gatherer societies, a lot of the rituals have to do with important things, like meat sharing, for example. Uh, so very few calories in a hunter-gatherer diet comes from meat. So it's hard to, it's hard to get meat because the, the meat carriers don't like to be eaten. They hit back. <laughs> uh, they kick back. Uh, and, and so it's hard, it's hard to hunt. So when you do get something, these are resource-poor environments, and the communities are very egalitarian because of this. They've got to they hang together or they'll hang separately, as Frank said. So, they, uh, so this is the evolution of the moral sense, cooperation, reciprocal altruism, that sort of thing. And uh, so rituals are used to, uh, so, well, okay, rituals are used in part to make sure that happens. Well, why doesn't it happen automatically? Because we're not perfectly moral beings. We also, there's also the, what's called the free rider problem. There's always people that will cheat just a little bit. Like, actually, most people will cheat a little bit. Uh, just push it a little bit. Maybe on the hunt, you, you slack off a tiny bit. Not so much that it's obvious, but, but if we hang around with you long enough, we know, yeah, this guy's a slacker, this guy's a hustler. You, know, you kind of know who he is. And so the rituals sort of help smooth over the free riding problem and the generosity problem to make sure. And then you just add a God component to it. You know, that, like there's a vis visible eye in the sky. Would you ascribe that to why some religious traditions today are kind of complicated? Would you think it's just an evolution of that? Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the Catholic rituals are really quite elaborate. <laughs> uh, but it's just what you get used to. You know, people are raised that way. Um, so the rituals are important behaviorally. It's all, but, but, it, but there's good reasons for it, practical reasons why they evolved in the first place. And then we just layer on top of it our own cultural stuff. Yeah. Well, she and I just Okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, could you talk a little bit about arguments against intelligent design? Arguments against intelligent design. Okay, uh, well, I wrote a whole book about this, <laughs> Why Darwin Matters, and I have uh, all the arguments in there. But there's other great books on this, too. So there's, you know, they have 20 or 30 really good arguments that I'd say boils down to maybe four or five that are, that are their best that they use. So the fine-tuned <coughs> argument, the universe is finely tuned for life. So one counter to that is, no, we're, mm -hmm. we're finely tuned for the... We're finely tuned to live in the universe. The universe is not finely tuned for us. It's a very egocentric way of thinking of it. You know, this whole thing is just... Wow, the entire cosmos. 13.7 billion years went by without me. And now, here I am, and it's all for me. It's such a human, egocentric way of thinking. It's just flip it. Um, so, um, I want to talk about the explanatory filter and the best inference to design. For example, if you see the face on Mars, yeah, this is one of my examples. You know, It's just an eroded mountain, but we see faces because we see faces. That's what our fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobe does. It sees faces. And so we see them everywhere. But, uh, but if you saw, and we know it's an eroded mountain, but if you saw um, the, um, what's the mountain with the president's faces on the Mount Rushmore? Mount Rushmore. No, nobody looks at Mount Rushmore and goes, boy, look at the erosion of that. <laughs> I mean, the wind and rain just happened to create four presidents. No. So that's obviously intelligently designed. That, that's their argument. Okay, so the problem with that is what's the equivalent of that in science, say, with DNA or the eye or something like that? But, Where's the obviously designed example versus the obviously artifactual design? Uh, there's nothing like that. So there's no algorithm you could use to say DNA definitely did not come from RNA or it definitely did. And here's the, they have nothing like that. So uh, anyway, so those are the sort of the core arguments. They try to distance themselves from the young earth and old earth creationists as being a little more crude in their arguments. These are supposed to be more sophisticated. Arguments. Um, Would you say irreducible complexity? Irreducible complexity, yeah. So we've refuted all those. Irreducible complexity is that, that, that you have to have all the components together in one place for it to work properly. Like the eye, you've got to have a lens and the cornea and the retina and, the, and, and so on. Everything has to be just rods and cones and everything has to work just right or you, or you can't see. Well, that's not true. <coughs> Actually, you can have 50% vision, and that's better than 40%. That's better than 0%. Uh, and, and so you can look through the entire animal kingdom and see that actually there's you know, eye spots that's better than having no eye spots. You just see if there's light over there or not. That's actually good. You can gravitate toward the light. Uh, and so Darwin answered all those questions in uh, the second edition of The Origin of Species, uh, which uh, in his chapter, Problem on Theory, actually that was in the first edition, and he expanded on that. Uh, this is called the problem of incipient stages that was put forth by a scientist named St. George Mivart who said, what good is half a wing? 
I can see the Darwinian argument for a fully evolved aerodynamic structure that helps you escape predators and capture prey as a full flying bird. But how do you get from zero wings to a little nub to you know 10% of a wing, 20% of a wing, 90% of a wing away? What would be the selective advantage of every stage where it can't fly? And Darwin answered that. Uh, in, in the second edition of The Origin. He said, because it wasn't a poorly developed wing, it was a well-developed something else. It turns out that's correct, probably thermal regulation. These are structures for use for other things that then become co-opted co co later for flight. Hmm. So we have arguments against all their things. Uh, how about in the back there? Checkered shirt. Nice and long. All right, so um, <laughs> this goes kind of back to the conspiracy theory thing. Uh, you said people are inside the bubble, it becomes obvious, but in a lot of cases, why do people persist on sequestering themselves in that bubble? Uh, it's like, I can imagine like when you're a Christian, you might feel really good that there's a God and a heaven that cares about you, but things like the 9-11 conspiracy seem to paint like a really bleak picture of the world. So why do people want to continue to persist in that sort of belief? Yeah, well, uh, their belief is not so bleak inside of it because they think they're going to expose the big corruption and then we'll fix the government. We will find out who those people are that are you know, <coughs> pulling the strings and we'll expose them and have a true democracy. Uh, you know, this is, the, this is you know, whether, whether you're on the, the Tea Party right or the Occupy left, you know, the, the, the belief is that people up there are doing things we don't like and there's not enough transparency and, damn it, we're going to do something about it. Uh, it, that, that is what's behind the, the, the conspiratorial thinking. It's a little bit of um, uh, that the way things are now is bad, but it can be better the way it used to be. Uh, so this is sort of a myth of the golden age. Uh, you know, back when America was a Christian nation, we just have to get back to those good old days. Or on the other side, you know, back to the agrarian lifestyle where everybody was equal and so on. Well, you can't support seven billion people on a hunter-gatherer, simple agrarian lifestyle. And we don't live in that world, but that, that's always that sort of dream, if we could just get back to that. And, and always, of course, people write themselves into that. There's no apocalyptic group holed up in a cave somewhere in Idaho with their guns and their gold that, that thinks that things are going to be bad. They think it's going to be bad, but not for me, because I got my guns and gold. The U.S. economy is going to crash, the whole thing will dissolve all these people will die and then I'll come out of my cave and we'll start a new community and it's going to be great. <laughs> you know, it's really a destruction redemption myth. It's like the Christian myth. You know, the things are bad and then, these, you know, then, then the resurrection and then, you know, we're all, all resurrected again and we're with God and it's, you know, the milk and honey and there's no pain and everything, justice is served and everything's great. This is a very common theme. We've got time for one, one more question. Oh, uh, we, we had not heard from young lady in the back. We have not heard from you. Yeah, not but lights and loud. Um, I know you participated in debates, but do you think that debates have uh, like educational value, and do you think that they really benefit the audience that they're for, or are you uh, maybe are you also, or are you concerned that they push the audience? And I'm not talking about the debaters, like whether you that, but for anyone watching the debates, do you think it would? It risks too much, like pushing the audience into their previous beliefs. There is that risk, but of course, like politicians, we're after the undecided voters. You know, the people that have not chosen sides yet. Of course, the hardcores on either side are not going to change their mind. We know that. Uh, but if I could plant a seed of doubt in, in their mind, just just a tiny bit, is it possible you could be wrong, and that those other two billion people are not you know, just crazy? Maybe. Yeah. And, and then to the undecided voters, you know, you make your case and you hope they, they vote for you, <laughs> so to speak. So I, I think it, it does have a useful thing, especially on college campuses where, you know, that's sort of the idea of open inquiry, open free inquiries. Let, let's hear all sides. I'm never afraid to, to let people have their say. Let the Holocaust deniers make their claims. We'll just shoot them down. Same thing with the creationists. I don't care. Sure, have your say. So, so just on that note, Dawkins has a little thing for, for why he doesn't debate creationists. And my fear has always been that that legitimizes them if they're on stage with a scientist and people don't have enough under, they don't, they don't have a, Americans as, as a, in general don't have enough understanding of science to be able to discern good arguments from bad arguments. So 
it makes it seem like there's some kind of parallel or legitimacy because they're standing up there with the scientists. Yeah. How would you? Yeah, there's a, there, there is that risk. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't, I'm doing something different than what Dawkins does, you know, or this is what do we do? You know, we, at Skeptic, we address controversial claims and say, okay, the scientists won't give you the time of day because they're busy, but we will. Go ahead and make your, make your best shot. Right. You know, irreducible complexity, you think it's the, the, the Holocaust, whatever, make your best shot and we'll, we'll take it. So that's what we do. Yeah, and Christopher Hitchens said that one of his proudest moments was defending, is it David Irving? Or I can't remember. Yeah, David Irving. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for free speech, yes. For free speech, that's right, that's right. He didn't agree with his conclusions, but he thought he had every right to voice those conclusions and then open them up to scrutiny. Right. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's right. So, yep. Yeah. Well, uh, a very warm thank, thank, thank you. you. Ten minutes if you want to come up and say hi or grab a photo. <coughs> Don, I hope to see you Friday night. Come tomorrow. 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 Tomorrow.